Um, the big thing that comes out of all of this, beyond just simply the presence of 35 countries, is that Russia has been actively working, not just this past year, but in the last five to 10 years in getting to where it is today, to where it simply will say, we tried working with the West. The West has constantly rebuffed us. They see us as an adversary rather than a partner, an equal partner. Fair enough. We'll go with our own group. We'll create our own, not so much a separate piece, but we'll create our own alliance network and we'll just ignore them entirely. And I think that this is ultimately what Russia can walk away from after this one year at Heading Bricks. Hello, everybody. This is Pascal from Neutrality Studies, and today I'm joined for the third time by Dr. Michael Rossi, who's a lecturer at Rutgers University in New Jersey, where he teaches political science and international relations. He's also the host of a YouTube channel of the name Michael Rossi Polsai, on which he keeps publishing very valuable primary sources in the form of uncommented speeches and press releases from Russia, and he's also started doing his own interviews and discussions. Most recently, he has been working on publishing the documents and interviews coming out of the BRICS meeting in Kazan that was taking place in Russia, of course, last week. This is what we want to discuss today. So, Michael, welcome. Hello, Pascal. Good to see you again, back for the third time. So um, we must have a really good uh, rapport uh, between us here. Happy Hi. to be back. I love talking to you. The, your your level of analysis is absolutely brilliant and your understanding of what's happening in and around Russia. I mean, you're currently also in Uzbekistan. You're, you're kind of watching, you were watching what happened in Kazan from like geographical proximity. Um, can you give us, first of all, your overview, um, how you how you frame and understand this Kazan BRICS meeting? We had other BRICS meetings. This was the 16th, right? This was not the first yes. one, but what stood out to you in particular? So three things, three big, broad things, which um, you know we can uh, dissect um, over the next hour or so. Um, the first major observation, and this is probably the most important, is that the BRICS meeting in Kazan was for Russia um, an overwhelming success. Um, 35 countries attended. Um, six heads of international organizations, including Antonio Guterres, the UN General Secretary, was there. Um, so in this, if the West and, uh, you know, we're talking the United States in particular, had any hope of um, politically, um, economically sanctioning Russia, isolating Russia, um, this was a failure. Um, I mean, this was, at least for the West, um, an absolute failure, in my opinion, of ensuring that Russia is um, isolated beyond only a few small, irrelevant countries. Um, you know, by by my last count here, um, in addition to the um, original BRICS-5, we had in attendance the new, uh, newly joined members of BRICS, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Iran, Ethiopia, United Arab Emirates, um, along with a list of countries, I mean, I can list them right here. I mean, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Belarus, Bolivia, Congo, Cuba, Indonesia, Kazakhstan, which was a big one because um, Kazakhstan had played uh, had plays a foreign policy of multi-vector diplomacy for years. And the fact that Kazakhstan and its president, Tom, uh, Kasim Jomar Tokayev, <clears throat> was in attendance was big. Laos, <clears throat> Malaysia, Mauritania, Mongolia, Nicaragua, Palestine, Serbia, Sri Lanka, Tajikistan, Thailand, Turkey, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan. So president of the country that I'm currently in was also in attendance, Venezuela and Vietnam. So this was the first big thing is that this was just by the sake of it having by the sake of it happening, um, a series of conferences, bilateral meetings. This was a resounding success for Russian foreign policy, and in particular for Vladimir Putin and Sergei Lavrov. The second issue is that after this, there is, in my opinion, no doubt, no doubt in my mind that multipolarism is here. Um, but more importantly, 
we may be seeing the emergence of new power alignments. There had been much talk in the sense that BRICS, um, just why it's 10 members, can serve as a counterbalance to the G7. So I know we talk a lot about the shifting towards a multipolar world, but this stays within the concept of state-to-state -state relations. And we miss um, the importance of growing institutions, both formal as well as informal. This is something that we should also discuss. And the third um, observation that I get is that if we are to divide the world roughly between the West and the rest, the rest, which is largely represented here, is pulling away from the West. They're not antagonizing. They don't see it as, um, I think in the words of um, Indian Prime Minister uh, Modi, BRICS is not anti-Western, it's just simply non-Western. And so in this, it reaffirms really my second point, in that multipolarism is truly here to say. So these are the three you know, big things that I've uh, taken away from the uh, Kazan summit. You use the term multipolarism. Do you use that um, on purpose? Not, not multipolarity, but ism? Um, is there a, a meaning behind that or you use them equivalently? Um, they're they're interchangeable. Um, you know, with, within the academic discipline, um, we have been discussed within IR theory, right? We've been discussing unipolarism, multipolarism, bipolarism, or whether it's ism or arity, you know, unipolarity, unipolarism. Um, the ism I like to refer to is more the theory. Um, the ar you know, the the arity, the multipolarity is more of the practice, but ultimately we're talking about the same thing. Okay, okay, sorry. I just wanted to make sure that I'm not missing an important nuance here. Um, so these are three very important points. Um, can you maybe let us know, like the 35 countries that took part, apart from the the core members, because the core members is now about nine or 10 or, or, or 12. I mean, it's the original um, five plus... You have the original five. The, the idea was to bring six in, including yeah. Argentina. Yeah. Um, but then Argentina uh, had backed out after the presidential yeah. election. Millet is uh, sort of a committed pro-American libertarian. Yeah. So we're just kind of waiting in the wings for this one. Um, to be absolutely clear here, Saudi Arabia has not yet <clears throat> formally joined um, as the other um, um, Egypt, uh, Iran, Ethiopia, UAE, they joined formally on January 1st of this year. Saudi Arabia is joining. They're just um, delaying it. But for all intents and purposes, we see them, um, you know, as a BRICS member. Um, but you know, when we look at the other countries that um, had um, had attended, um, I had pointed out Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, Tajikistan and Turkmenistan so and Kyrgyzstan. So the five Central Asian stands are there. What this, in my opinion, means is that this, um, you know, solidifies Central Asia's position within um, Shanghai cooperation, uh, One Belt, One Road, you know, Brit I mean, all of the, uh, the we're, there's multi layers of these various international agreements and associations. Um, you know, where I am here in Central Asia, there is always talk about whether the United States will um increase its influence, um, its leverage within the region. And the fact that they are at the BRICS conference um, doesn't signify that they're going to become formal members. But both had applied for what we would call partnership status. Um, and so we see that there are a number of different levels of association with BRICS. You have formal members, you have partnership relations, so sort of um, cooperative um, ventures and projects. Uh, and the fact that both Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan joined um, gives me reason to hypothesize that Central Asia um, is now definitively within this larger association. Right. But um, one of the things that has been going through my mind for a while, and I've talked about this a few times on my channel, is like that BRICS is now at a very crucial moment of institutionalization, right? And a lot of the decisions taking now, taken now in terms of like who's a member and what kind of member statuses there are, are going to be very important, like 20, 30 years down the road. I mean, we can see how the United 
nations is basically deadlocked because of its inst- the, the way that it is institutionally set up. Now, yeah. BRICS was an informal club of five members, and they last year in uh, South Africa, they made uh, a catalog of how to join BRICS, like what are the five steps? And the final step is that the, the, the pre-final step is that uh, the presiding country recommends to the rest to uh, to invite somebody, then the invitation is given. And then once that's done, it's done and you're a full fledged 100% member. This is what then also happened last year with these uh, now, we, as we know, five new members that uh, or six members that joined. Um, and they were invited this year for the first time as full members. So um, uh, the important thing is that full members basically have a veto over everything that's happening, right? This is yes. very crucial. They, in this sense, BRICS, the BRICS club works like ASEAN in a way. Um, so if you add more and more of those countries, at some point you will deadlock yourself. Now, exactly. do we have a new status? These 35 or uh, uh, what would it be, 25 or so other countries that showed up and had either um, prime ministers or foreign ministers there were, uh, to my knowledge, nobody was now invited, right, into the core group that we have, no additional countries, but we have new statuses uh, in uh, in association. Can you talk about that? So you're right. Um, There's no formal invitation just yet because as BRICS grows, right, I absolutely agree with you on this, right? The larger it becomes, the more problematic, the more cumbersome it becomes. This is the general rule of institutions, especially if you give every member an equal um, vote. Um, And to be sure, there have been problems before with other countries that have wanted to join along with the previous five. Um, And this, we include Bahrain, Bangladesh are two of them. And there's always some problem between either India or China or one of the two. Um, What we got out of the um, summit is that the partner states are those that will associate with BRICS, but will not become full official members just yet. So all of this was sort of enumerated within the Kazan Declaration, which I've gone through. It's incredibly cumbersome. It's 134 points. Um, So, you know, it makes for it it makes for some in-depth reading here. But one of the key issues that the Kazan Declaration um, emphasizes is the strengthening of multilateralism. So you you begin to see how BRICS is um, it's a work in Prague. It goes from more than just five states, which you can easily manage through state to state relation. But more and more, you begin to see the need for um, you know, f- f- formal third party institutional structure to manage the affairs of all of these countries. And so I think that the creation of partner states is, in a way, a preliminary way to get interested countries that want to join the ability to work within, work with formal countries for smoothing out relations, hashing out any kind of differences. And therefore, when formal uh, membership is applied, you don't have any sudden um, unexpected occurrences where our countries decide we don't want them or not. So it's a, you know, it, it is a way of trying to create almost a mini United Nations. But what's also important within this is the key adherence to the principles of the UN Charter, which is the reason why uh, Guterres was invited. So as you point out, the United Nations is horrendously deadlocked, especially when it comes to the Security Council. And yet there is always these lofty praises for the UN for at least its original intention, right? Its original idea. Um, And maybe, maybe I've, I've heard some people hypothesize these are in editorials. This is not anything really academic that you leave the West out and you have the rest as sort of like a, a, you know, a smaller derivative of the UN, you might actually accomplish something more. And it's interesting because I was also thinking about how this is taking on more and more of a shape of the old non-aligned movement, which uh, was formed, uh, right? I mean, um, it's, you know, the non here you have, you know, India, um, Ethiopia, Egypt, 
Indonesia, Serbia was present, I guess, and it's, uh, you know, representing the old Yugoslav idea, um, although I wouldn't put too, I wouldn't put too much hope um, in Serbia joining BRICS unless the EU definitively closes the door um, on then. But, you know, to, to be to be really fair in this, um, the fact that Serbia sent not its um, um, prime minister or president. I forget if, if Vucic is the prime minister or the president. At this president. Point. He constantly I think he's the president. He constantly I, rotates. Yeah. Uh, but they said the deputy prime minister, Alexander Vulin, uh, was in attendance. And um, this was really a sort of an indirect way of kind of signaling to the European Union, right, that, you know, Serbia and also Turkey, right, have alternatives um, if the EU is, uh, you know, not going to invite them in. Um, so the way that I see it is the, you know, the Kazan Declaration sets out steps for harmonization for formal members as well as partner states. Um, from what I've understood, the countries that have officially applied for membership, right, official membership, Azerbaijan, Bangladesh, Myanmar, Pakistan, Senegal, Sri Lanka, Syria, and Venezuela. They have applied for formal membership. Um, those that have officially applied as partner states right now, Turkey, Indonesia, Algeria, Belarus, Cuba, Bolivia, Malaysia, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Thailand, Vietnam, Nigeria, and Uganda. So the, the when, when Putin is making these um, remarks about how there are states lining up to join BRICS, right? we already begin to see tiered member states. So it shows that BRICS is becoming much more intricate from its original foundation. I think this is one of the other things that we can get out of the Kazan summit. But this is an, this is an interesting list because the... I mean, the ones that inc that that apply for full membership include countries like uh, Myanmar, and you know, Myanmar is is even like on freeze at the moment within ASEAN because it is unclear who's the actual uh, ruler of 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 Myanmar because of the in internal uh, 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 the civil war that Myanmar is going through yes. and the, the the coup that took place against which is something that ASEAN really didn't want to see and 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 so on and on the other hand we have the more the more um likely or more institutionally capable members in the uh, in the list of of countries applying for partner status including uh, Malaysia and and Indonesia and Thailand I mean and those are those are very large southeast asian uh, um economies and 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 well polities why <laughs> can you make sense out of this so when we look at um, the way that I see it, when we look at uh, future geostrategic areas of interest around the world, Southeast Asia is certainly one that is gearing up for uh, you know the the Western Bloc, which is the U.S., <clears throat> Taiwan, South Korea, and Japan, um, and <clears throat> expanding BRICS influence. When we look at let's say uh, Thailand, uh, Malaysia, and uh, Indonesia, ASEAN is uh, was represented unofficially there. And to my understanding, and this I only got out of some of the commentaries, but BRICS is working with ASEAN to smooth over a lot of these differences, including um, the controversy over recognizing which government is the legitimate one uh, within Myanmar. So in this case, right, BRICS is looking to unofficially, the way that I see it, unofficially, acquire more of a um, political mindset, or at least a political mindset that sees itself as an alternative to the transatlantic American-led um, neoliberal approach. So in this regard, um, BRICS is looking at places like Southeast Asia, Africa, and Latin America, um, but through primarily the economic lens as an alternative to that of the American-led alliance network. Yeah, and they're doing that apparently successfully so because you also listed a Mongolia that was present uh, at the BRICS summit. And Mongolia, you know, refrained from uh, joining the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. It's basically the yeah. only one that didn't join, but that's only an observer state. So in a sense, is BRICS successful at signaling to to hesitant countries that it's not an alliance and it's not a it's not a fixed club, but it is a more as a... a um, 
you know, whatever works for you, we will try to accommodate it kind of situation, which we don't, I mean, BRICS is often compared with the G7 or the G20, but I think at this point, it's really starting to, to behave like uh, as its own kind of initiative in world affairs. Yeah. That's difficult. Maybe the NUM, maybe the NUM is the closest thing to compare it to. Yeah, which again, NAM is more of a conception than any real organized <laughs> institution. Um, you're, I'm glad that you brought that up about G7, because in the same way that um, it was emphasized that BRICS is not anti-Western, it was also emphasized that BRICS is not going to become another G7. Right? Mm. They made that very, very clear. Right? They said it's not going to become another G7, um, but it is poised to become some alternative. I think if there was one um, unknown that still comes out of Kazan is what will BRICS ultimately become? And I think the reason why we don't have a definitive answer is because its members, its formal members and its aspiring members have yet to figure this out. Um, and the more join, the more voices the more input, the more cacophony yeah. that comes along with this. Um, so in this case, right, BRICS might feel the need to, you know, we invite certain members, but we keep it at a core group of 10, maybe 12 tops for the time being, because they really want to emphasize that membership is still on a national basis. So it's not like when you join NATO or you join the European Union that states give up an element of their sovereignty or their sovereign decision making to some bureaucratic um, organization in Brussels. That is not the case at all. Right. They really want to play into the idea that by joining BRICS, a state will enhance its sovereignty, not reduce it. Yeah, it's it's a different principle. It's not you you're you're not giving up the the, the sovereign decision making, but that that means that BRICS is I mean for all the momentum it has, and right now it has great momentum. But this is a major challenge. And again, uh, you know, I just learned last weekend from Malta's former foreign minister uh, uh, Alexander Trigona. Uh, who was here in Japan while we were Pokemon shopping for his grandchildren, he <laughs> told me the story of NUM and Malta being part of the NUM. And he said the main reason the NUM never got a permanent secretariat and never got more permanent structures is because Tito, Yugoslavia's Tito was dead set against it. Because Tito mm -hmm. said, if we do that, if we have an if we have a permanent structures, the Soviets will undermine it. They will they will infiltrate it, and they will you know it will it will crumble and become nothing. So we rather have a loose structure um, than than a than than a fixed a fixed one yeah. with the secretariat and so on. Um, and similar discussions about the benefits and and drawbacks of of fixed institutionalization must be happening inside BRICS. Um, mm -hmm. So what is the outcome now in terms of? making BRICS a more formal organization with given structures, maybe even a secretariat. But we haven't heard anything about a secretariat, have we? No, no. And the big thing is, and a lot of people have been asking this, especially journalists, is that if BRICS is also modeling itself primarily as a alliance or a coalition of countries that want to engage primarily economically, outside the American financial system, will there eventually be a united BRICS currency? Like, Is there going to be like a, 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 an, old, a an equivalent to the euro that BRICS has? And Putin has said there is no talk of that at, you know, at, at any point right now. One of the key agreements that comes out of the, um, the, the summit in Kazan is... Um, Financial transactions will take place within the national currencies of these countries, right? So it it fits more so within the the topic of de-dollarization that we've all been talking about, um, where the dollar is no longer seen as the universal form of exchange. But at the same time, there is no talk of any unified BRICS uh, currency. Um, there has yet to be an agreed upon alternative to SWIFT payments. Um, so hence countries are just engaging on a state to state, um, basis of transaction, which does the job in the immediate sense, 
but it leaves open right this question of will there be more harmonization uh more streamlining especially as a number of countries around the world and we're, you know we're talking about countries in africa latin america um, we can't just be using every country's national currency, but for the time being, this is what is agreed upon. So, you know, to sort of answer the question about whether or not this will become NAM, but with a central bureaucratic authority, the best thing that I can say right now, and again, this is all hypothetics, but knowing that Guterres was invited to Kazan, it seems to me that BRICS, given its capability, its realistic capabilities right now, it might be poised to become the next voting block in mm -hmm. the UNGA, right? And within studies of the United Nations, um, you know, voting blocks, North versus South, East versus West, First World versus Second World, with Third World being the, um, you know, the, the spoiler, this may be something that we might look for in the future is that there is a BRICS voting block, particularly when it comes to um, issues of transnational economics, humanitarian intervention, um, climate and human and um, and environmental issues. These are all things that were brought up within the Kazan Declaration. So it almost seems like this is a way of taking individual states and making certain that they are all on the same page with these larger transnational issues and challenges. What do you make out of Guterres actually going there? I mean, that was a huge surprise to me. I, I didn't I didn't think that the UN would get involved on that level. I mean, okay, on the one hand, he doesn't have he doesn't have an, another term ahead of himself. So personally, that's fine, but he really leaned far out of the window here, didn't he? Like, and the question was asked at one of the press conferences with um, uh, Putin, and it was, you know, explain, uh, you know, Guterres's, uh, you know, uh, presence, and you know, Putin very, you know, calmly says he was invited and he accepted the invitation. No, sort of very keep, very, very even keel like that. But it was noticed in the West, especially in Ukraine. It was definitely noticed um, Guterres did not go to uh, Kiev, has not been there, but he has gone to Russia. And this, of course, is seen in the West as a complete disregard for uh, the ICJ decision that, uh, you know, Putin needs to uh, be arrested. Uh, but then again, you know, the West will, you know, play, uh, you know, two sides to this. So we will lament that, uh, you know, Putin is still given um you know um celebrity status while inviting you know, Benjamin Netanyahu to speak uh, you know in the US Congress to you know standing ovations here so you know ICJ is whatever it is yeah I um, mean, but sorry i just want to add like um it was the ICC decision right uh, not the ICJ because the ICJ you're right i'm sorry yes, ICJ, ICJ is part yes. of the UN the ICC isn't it's the Rome statute but the the, the, the this kind of shows that okay we you might see the UN as a bit in the pocket of the US because it has a headquarter in New York but actually it isn't it's actually also more independent than it's not the West the UN is not an is not an institution of the West it's actually a global institution and Guterres yeah. actually said like yeah fine so I have a lot of members who are gathering there they invite me I should probably go yes yes and I think that um, his presence the um especially um puts uh, you know any doubt to rest right that this was a resounding uh, success um the fact that you had um you know, 35 countries as i had listed and i mean of those that could possibly be seen as western um you know european i mean maybe armenia serbia for sure um obviously a couple of countries we can see were not the hungary was not there slovakia was not there. I mean, both of them are EU members, but they're both led by individuals that certainly are, uh, you know, no critics of BRICS, no critics of Putin. Um, Slovakia's Prime Minister Fico uh, just stated yesterday, the day before, that he has plans to go to uh, Moscow next year for Victory Day for the 80th anniversary of the end of the Second World War. Um, you know, we don't know, uh, you know, what um, Orban will do, but they were not there, right? Serbia was the only uh, European country there. The rest of them, um, either from 
Latin America, the Middle East, former Soviet Union, uh, the global south, right? You want to call them the global south, the, the, the developing world. Um, they also make up large percentage of the world's population. So in this regard, um, Guterres going there as the UN head, uh, you know, we need to you know, understand that, yes, its main headquarters is in New York, but it is a global organization. Yeah, and the also the talk uh, by BRICS, and you already said so, but it's not anti-UN. It is very much pro-UN, and is it is very much pro non non Western controlled institutions. I mean, on the one hand, the the World Bank and the IMF are something that BRICS doesn't try to support outright; that they are rather trying to create uh, uh, alternatives to. Yes, but the other institutions, the UN, they don't try to create an alternative. The WTO, no, they are saying we want to work through the WTO because yes. the WTO is actually not controlled by yes. um, by a certain little group of countries. It is currently out of order because the appeals mechanism is broken by the US by not 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 appointing a judge. But so the, the BRICS tries to BRICS tries to kind of complement um, lacking parts of the current international system. Is my is my impression? What is yours? Yes, it's largely seen as patching up problems with the UN, addressing the need for UN reform, which has been on, you know, it's been a topic of discussion since the 1980s. Um, so you can kind of see BRICS as somewhat of a conservative organization, not in an ideological sense, but in an idea that um, there's no need to create another set of laws or another set of parallel institutions, but rather have BRICS countries through the Kazan Declaration. And again, Kazan Declaration is all of the signatories, including those non-formal BRICS members. So it commits these countries in a way to uphold certain uh, principles of, again, strengthening multilateralism, addressing global and regional security, uh, financial and economic cooperation, humanitarian exchanges. Um, there was a uh, significant section devoted to um, peace and security in the Middle East, formal support for Palestinian statehood. Uh, many of the countries that were present, not all of them, but many of them recognize Palestine as a sovereign state within the 1967 UN uh, borders, which means also East Jerusalem as a capital of a future Palestinian state. So what this does is simply give teeth, some kind of teeth, or at least nothing more than um, um, strength and credibility to already established UN institutions and principles how do you think this is now going to influence decision making in the West? Is it because so far, I mean, a lot of the approaches by the US, but also Europe has been to dismiss BRICS yeah. as, oh, those those countries that, you know, those unstable dictatorships that that, you know, nobody, no, I mean, small economies I've heard I've heard that kind of talk of people saying, yeah, you know, India is a huge country, but currently still only five times larger, five times larger economy than Poland. Like I can't remember, but something to that extent, yeah. you know, belittling yeah. them. Mm -hmm. I think this will change now the, um, the Western <sighs> approach. I mean, it's really you know, hard to crack them. <laughs> yeah. You know, the thing about. You know, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with the principles of cognitive dissonance, right? Mm -hmm. The more that your vision of the world is confronted with realities, you just kind of dig deeper into your visions of the world. Um, yeah, I mean, if nothing else, <clears throat> the BRICS summit was seen as at absolute best, right? At absolute best. Um, you know, some signs that Russia is not completely diplomatically isolated beyond Belarus, North Korea, Syria, and uh, China. I think you mentioned India. Right? We, we have to really talk. I mean, India is one of those countries that has never really been regarded as a staunch ally or partner of Russia. I think we can, you know, the United States in particular just kind of lumps Russia and China, you know, in together. Um and that was on full display 
full display at the uh, you know in uh, in Kazan is that Russian Chinese uh, relations are closer than ever, but India has always been kind of the deal breaker, and um, I'm I was reminded that shortly after the start of the special military operation, the, the war in Ukraine, um, India was one of the first countries to completely ignore the sanctions that were put against Russia and continue to buy oil and natural gas through both the ruble and the rupee. I mean, in a way, India had saved Russia from you know initial economic collapse. So if the West wants to continue to disregard this as, you know, the developing world, the third world, um, you know, whatever Orientalist trope that you want to uh, classify the global south of the developing world outside of Josep Borrell's garden, um, do it at your own risk. But don't be surprised then when countries like Cuba or Venezuela are able to survive their own uh, sanctions put against them by the West, right? Cuba formally applied as a partner state in BRICS. Venezuela has applied to be a, a formal member. So I would, if if I were a U.S. foreign policy analyst from, you know, from Washington, State Department, I'm just talking about academia, I'm talking about like a policy analyst, I would be very wary about what's happening in Latin America, not just South America, but Central America as well. And the, the proclivity to dismiss anything outside of the G7 simply by saying that these economies are you know, much smaller than the Americans, the British. Um, you know, people have oftentimes said that the Russian economy is about as large as the Italians. Um, fine, but the Russian economy is growing. And at the same time, they're really not all that interested in what the West has to say anymore. It's okay, you want to dismiss us, go right ahead. We're continuing to form our own group. And again, they're not even interested in um, um, dismembering or dislodging G7. They just don't care. Yeah, uh, this this is maybe <clears throat> one of the biggest insights, right? This is not a rival club. This is not a club no. uh, to to oppose anyone. And in this sense, BRICS doesn't need an enemy, doesn't need a foe the way NATO needs a foe, right, to to justify its own existence. BRICS exists now for the for the sake of countries wanting to be there and wanting to engage outside of the of the dictate of of, yeah. of the classic. Uh, 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 imperial white european uh, elites right um I, I, it strikes me as that and it's it's now successful in doing so question though about africa how big is the is is the the the, the cooperation collaboration and the interest from african states of of going that route as well especially sub saharan so obviously the major one is south africa mm -hmm. uh one of the you know core members of brics but we have to also note that just because a country like South Africa um, is a member, that doesn't mean that they're, all of their political parties, that all of their uh, political interests are locked in. Hmm. So, you know, currently, right, Cyril Ramaphosa is a big fan of BRICS, um, very much um, in line with the global vision of people like Putin and Modi. And Xi Jinping, but he has coalition partners within the current South African government that are very wary about locking themselves completely within this alliance at the expense of the West. So, you know, Africa, there's going to be, I not just with um, South Africa, but Nigeria is a country to look for in the future, Tanzania. Uh, Botswana, uh, Namibia, we need to look for. Um, Central Africa is widely overlooked by the West. Um, you know, we talk about how Central Africa or Central West Africa is sort of emerging out from uh, the post colonial French influence, uh, Mali, Burkina Faso, among others, uh, towards Russia, China, BRICS. Um, but most of the African countries that we see that are 
moving towards BRICS right now are either in the extreme north. You have Algeria that's looking, right? Egypt is already a member. And of course, Southern Africa, you have South Africa. Central Africa is going to be a major, major uh, game board within the next few years and decades. And maybe did you observe anything about Turkey and the Kazan meeting? I mean, that's maybe one of the most interesting European ones, right? Because it is a member of NATO and it now yes. actually applied to be, a you said, a partner state, right? A partner state. Erdogan was there in person. Mm -hmm. right? So we're not talking about some deputy foreign minister or some, you know, other, but we're talking about the head of state. Um, Russian-Turkish relations are quite interesting. Um, you know, of the seven days of the week, Russia and Turkey get along flawlessly four and then have problems the other three. Um, but Putin has publicly stated that he, you know, likes Erdogan. He sees him as someone that he can um, talk with, speak with. And the understanding that, uh, you know, Turkey's, you know, EU, eventual EU membership has just been indefinitely postponed. And at this stage of the game is almost counterproductive. Um, Erdogan has said that BRICS seems like the better and more likely association. And it doesn't necessarily uh, mean that this will jeopardize Turkey's membership within NATO, Although a few hardliners in Turkey have said eventually that they just need to pull away from NATO, but I'm not touching that at any point. But the understanding that Turkey's economy is increasingly drawn towards the central Eurasian landmass, India, Russia, China, as well as their relations with the central Asian stands. No surprise whatsoever that, uh, that Erdogan is there. And the fact that he applied for a partnerships uh, member also implies that you know, the EU is a distant memory as far as Turkey is concerned. That's fascinating. And um, are there other observations that you that you have about the Kazan meeting that that maybe also in the news hasn't been discussed much? Well, what's also interesting is Bangladesh and Sri Lanka, two countries that have undergone, um, you know, sort of regime change, rapid uh, regime change, political volatility. Both of them have applied for formal BRICS membership. In my opinion, volatile states like this, especially those that wish to avoid potential color revolutions or any interference from the West, sort of see BRICS maybe not as political security, but definitely economic. And so it really seems increasingly that there's a set of neighborhood effects that come in when more countries are publicly stating their interest in closer relations with BRICS or formal membership, subsequent countries are following. Algeria... Um, I should mention, um, applied for um, earlier membership, but had been um, sort of sidelined. I, I, I forget which country it was. I think it was, um, I think India had some issue <clears throat> with, uh, with Algeria. Um, but knowing that North Africa is um, looking more and more towards BRICS, away from, I mean, you know, NATO, the EU is just literally to the north of them in the Mediterranean already implies that we see, um, as I said before, maybe not so much multipolarity, but I'm almost beginning to see a type of institutional realignment around the world. The EU, NATO in Europe, BRICS and Shanghai cooperation in the developing world, one belt, one road. It's not really a an organization, but it's you know a set of um, construction infrastructural initiatives that are part of SCO. And a lot of the developing world right, sees this as the future. And the fact that all, once again, all five Central Asian stands were present and their heads of state were there as well implies that they see this as a far more secure investment, if nothing else, because it's economic cooperation without any political cost. Right. And the, the summit meeting really was only actually only one of about 200 uh, initiatives that Russia has exactly. been channeling over the over 2024 um, as the um, um, 
presiding over over BRICS, right? Uh, yes. And a lot a lot of decisions were already made on ministerial level or on working group levels beforehand. Obviously, also the the the, the negotiating uh, negotiation of this outcome document. Um, what are the more concrete um, outcomes now of this one year? Nearly, I mean, two months left, but. 10 months of uh, Russia's uh, presidency of BRICS, of concrete outcome in terms of infrastructure building, uh, not, uh, not just the physical ones, but also the uh, uh, like the currency system and 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 ideological, uh, not ideological, sorry, what the, what's the word I'm looking for, like administrative uh, uh, um, infrastructure that they're building. So this goes right back to my first observation. The big thing, the, the one thing that we can all take away from this is that uh, Russia's, um, I guess you would call it presidency or its administrative um, head of BRICS this year, um, showed that it's not isolated and that it has new friends, new allies, new partners, and that any sanctions that are coming against it from the West, particularly Europe, is widely just being ignored at this point. Um, in addition to that, right, the bilateral uh, talks and meetings that you just you know mentioned um, bring in a couple of things. One is the, um, I think it's called the Trans-Caspian Pipeline or sort of a north-south uh, transit route that deliver, it's, it's a road network, rail network, and pipeline network from Russia through Azerbaijan, down through the Caspian Sea, um, into Iran, through the Persian Gulf. This effectively is a way of bypassing Europe altogether. So in this, Russia is very much alive and well. Russia has successfully pivoted away from Europe. In fact, I'd even go so far as to say um, that if we remember roughly, um, what, 15, almost, tw almost 20 years ago, um, Putin made his um, famous, infamous, speech at the Munich Security Conference yeah. in 2007. This is widely seen as Russia's first real verbal um, warning. critique, yeah. warning, critique of American-led liberalist foreign policy. Um, and you could have seen the, you know, the dagger eyes coming from many Western heads of state in the audience. Um, one year later, 2008, an incredibly important year, um, Kosovo unilaterally declares independence. Uh, the Bucharest summit, the NATO Bucharest summit, um, verbally gives um, approval, membership, eventual membership to uh, Moldova, Georgia, and Ukraine, major red flags. Uh, the war in Georgia over Abkhazia, South Ossetia, Russia's intervention. Um, this is Russia you know, openly um, protesting, right, West, the West's, um, you know, perceived monopoly on foreign policy. And really the beginning of Russia uh, being perceived as an adversary, not as a compliant partner. A um, few years later, you have 2014, the Maidan movement, the Crimean annexation, um, and then followed by eight years of this sort of semi-frozen conflict in Donbass, then with the uh, outbreak of war in Ukraine and the attempts to, as I said before, isolate Russia. Um, the big thing that comes out of all of this beyond just simply the presence of 35 countries is that Russia has been actively working, not just this past year, but in the last five to 10 years in getting to where it is today, to where it simply will say, we tried working with the West, and this is Russia's narrative, right? This is Russia's narrative. We tried working with the West. The West has constantly rebuffed us. They see us as an adversary rather than a partner, an equal partner. Fair enough. We'll go with our own group. We'll create our own, not so much a separate piece, but we'll create our own alliance network and we'll just ignore them entirely. And I think that this is ultimately what Russia can walk away from after this one year at heading BRICS, right? Because they presided over BRICS member expansion. They presided over a number of formal applications for future membership, as well as partnership status. 
which shows that if nothing else, right, Russia has partners, allies, it, or just simply cooperative interests in the developing world. Yeah, it's a good summary. I mean, the for anyone who doesn't believe that Russia ever wanted to integrate, is like you just we just need to remember Russia was part of the G7. It, yeah. it was it was enlarged to become the G8 and, and G8, included yes. Russia for a couple of years, right? And then 2008 was the time when it was then kicked out of that one. Um and Russia applied. I mean, at least signaled its interest in becoming a NATO member twice, um, yeah. and it was the it was an idea from Russia, and it was it goes further back to to of course uh, um, 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 the, the Soviet times under under um, Mikhail Gorbachev to create a common European home. I mean, to create structures and integrate, and that at least according to Jeffrey Sachs was like rebuffed very clearly by by um washington brussels as in a big no-go yes. and now what we're um, seeing 20 uh, uh 15 years later is okay russia is working with the other partners and they're just they're creating their own club okay fine but not an adversarial one i think that's very important they don't try to be an enemy of of, of the west they just try to be another way of doing business and you developing. know i i want to i want to uh, point to this because both putin and lavrov um when they are giving press conferences, when they are giving addresses to audiences, um, you know, we have to know, unfortunately, unfortunately, most of this is unavailable in the West, hmm. um, not because of a language barrier, but because social media media has just simply banned it. It was outright. ignored. Kazan meeting was basically ignored by the New York Times, Washington Post. I mean, the yes. tiny mini articles, they don't even... They are, amount to nothing. It's absolutely no, it's drastic. just simply deleted. Um, uh, just as a as, as a side note to this side note, I think it was about two three weeks ago. Um, I was invited to give a talk um at, on RT RT English. Um, you know, forty five minute interview about um, you know, Russian foreign policy and uh, the peace talks in Ukraine, and um, the video that I had for my interview was up on YouTube for all of about 48 to 72 hours before the video was taken down, simply because RT has been banned. There's nothing controversial about it, but just, okay. So in this, right, my point here is that there's no need for Putin or Lavrov to be openly adversarial against the West. The West is adversarial on its own. So I see this as almost a, um, a very strategic uh, card to play by saying we don't need to get angry at you. It, you know, it, it almost in a way where you know, it, when you're dealing with, let's say, um, uh, you know, a troublesome relationship partner, right? You know, like um, narcissistic personality disorder or something like that. What the best way to effectively uh, deal with that is to go no contact. You know, go no contact, gray rock, you know, don't feed into the narcissism. Don't give them any ammunition with which to respond. Putin has always said, look, the West wants to work with us. We haven't switched off our phone. We haven't removed the U.S. State Department from, you know, speed dial. They want to talk about a ceasefire in Ukraine. They want to talk about re-engagement. We are ready to listen provided that they are substantive and realistic, right? This is what Putin and Lavrov has said. Now, whether they are genuine in this is, you know, a different story, but it plays into the idea that Russia seems far more level-headed and less emotional in this. They wanted to get, Putin has gone on record to say, Russia asked to join NATO. NATO said no. Fine. But if you're still going to give the green light to Ukraine, Georgia, Moldova, possibly even Armenia, right? We have to also remember that there is still open-ended issues with Armenia as well. This creates a security dilemma. Yeah. I also want to just say one thing, speaking of Armenia, a lot of people, a lot of my students had noted that at the larger plenary session, um, Pashinyan was sitting directly next to Aliyev, 
Armenia and Azerbaijan were put right next to the table. You can only imagine what, what the two of them must have been uh, talking about. So, but a couple of times the two of them were seemed to be engaging in sort of light, you know, conversation back and forth here. But um, I'm very curious, very curious to see what a, um, a final agreement will come um, resulting from the Karabakh debacle. Well, it would be it would be fantastic if BRICS would also serve as a as a venue place in order to bit by bit mend such adversarial ties. And uh, you know, uh, this would be kind of an Asian model, right, of 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 conflict management because we have India and China in the in the core group, and they have open border disputes, but they have been working a long time to resolve yeah. those. As has Russia with with. Uh, the 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 southern on its on its southern borders, right? I mean, we have here a history of trying to manage uh, relations with, I mean, adversarial relations and and shift them bit by bit and and solve the things that can be solved. So, which is very different from like the Western approach of ramming down its preferred outcomes, like let's say when it comes to Kosovo, uh, the throat of everybody else, who just has to take the fact that Kosovo is now. Uh, split off from the rest of Serbia and the US has a huge military base there, period. Um, BRICS doesn't work on that premise. No. In fact, if I'm looking here at the uh, countries in attendance, um, I mean, I could be wrong here. I know Turkey recognizes uh, Kosovo. Um, Mauritania at uh, one point recognized, I don't know how deep that recognition is. I know that Turkey certainly has um, you know, diplomatic uh, ties with Kosovo, but the vast majority of the others, right, do not. Um, you know, that's not to say that, you know, Kosovo has, Kosovo is weird because Kosovo, people say it's not connected to anything uh, today, but yet at the same time, everything at some point stems from that, in my opinion, very, very irresponsible decision by the United States to, you know, let Kosovo go outside of, um, you know, UN mediation. Well, it's it was it was like maybe on the pinnacle of of of, of the unipolar moment or was, slightly, yes. slightly after that. But it it's um this is not this is not how 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 international relations works anymore. Which is why we have to study and look at the BRICS and 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 hope that they will they will provide a more um consensual like forum yeah. for international relations. Um, any anything you want to add at this point? I was just about to say, you know, the one big thing that was largely not talked about at the BRICS summit was Ukraine. Right. Very little about Ukraine. Um, Palestine, yes. A ceasefire and lasting peace <laughs> um, between Israel, Palestine and Lebanon. That was talked about. Ukraine was, for the most part, seen as an internal issue for Russia, and most of these countries see it as just that, that they remain neutral on the issue, they will support any kind of peace agreement that comes out of it, but they're not getting involved. Turkey is a different story. Uh, Turkey is a member of NATO, but the rest of them either silently are on Russia's side simply because it's just a way of punking the West of NATO, or it's just an internal matter that yeah. it's none of their business. And maybe I just add, like, there is in one of the clauses, it, it, it points out the principle, like different principles. And one of the principles it affirms is the principle of neutrality. It's actually mentioned yeah. in there, which is which is interesting. It's like, OK, it's, you don't have to choose. And for the, for my for my channel and, and, and studies, of, of course, that's uh, it just shows again, like, no, the, the neutrality card will remain. But that may explain the presence of three Central Asian states, Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan. Now, Turkmenistan plays on this hard, hard, hard policy of neutrality, yeah. right? Yeah. We are not aligned. We are not involved yeah. with anything. The neutrality thing may bring them in. Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, a little bit different. Stronger economies, emerging countries on the map, Kazakhstan more so than Uzbekistan. But my argument is always where Kazakhstan goes, Uzbekistan follows. <laughs> But playing on the neutrality issue and making it non-political was what invited all five of them, especially Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, and Turkmenistan. Makes good sense. Makes, Makes good, good sense. sense. Yes. Um, Michael Rossi, thank you very much for your time today, and we will talk soon again.
Always a pleasure to be on your channel, Pascal. Thank you.